Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for A Dram of Outlander.com. For all things Outlander from the Dinah Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and anything interesting that falls between. This is podcast episode 168 and we are in week four of the Fiery Cross read along. Woo! Okay. <laughs> this week we are doing chapters five and six. Riotous unrest and for old Lang Syne. All right. So I totally committed a heinous midwife error in the last podcast. <laughs> I completely misspoke. Silver nitrate in baby's eyes is used for gonorrhea because when soldiers came back from war in the 20th century, they were rife with gonorrhea. So that's why Claire put silver nitrate in the baby's eyes just in case. And I accidentally said syphilis. I make myself sometimes outline of notes and then my stream of consciousness gets the best of me and I misspoke. So I apologize for that. (laughs) Okay. So we are still in the longest day ever at the gathering in Mount Helican, North Carolina, late October 1770, with cool, gray, and wet weather. Okay, so it's fall, and fall is falling really hard upon them. So, the significance to the chapter titles, Riotous Unrest, talks about, again, the Hillsborough Riot, and Claire gets a conversation with one of her patients who she's trying to fix up a little bit. And he accidentally was injured during the riots. He was not part of them. And so we get to hear more background story as it has to do with Edward Fanning. And... For old Lang Syne, that has to do with something that Roger and Brianna are contemplating. (laughs) We'll get there, but it's really like for good old time's sake. Good. But I did put a link in here for a video on YouTube that is amazing. And it has the song sung, but it has also the English words in there since it's Scots. <laughs> and I don't know if you knew this, but it's based on a poem written by Robbie Barnes. There you go, from 1788. So the prominent characters in these chapters are Claire, Murray, McLeod, Brianna, and Roger. Now, Claire and Murray McLeod, the apothecary, are only in the first chapter. Brianna and Roger end the first chapter and take over the entirety of chapter six. So, what is Claire up to? Claire is running her clinic. It seems like all the people who have waited till the last day of the gathering decided they need medical treatment. (laughs) And we see her working with a patient and she's talking about iodine as being a course of treatment. So I put in a link for sources of iodine, or she would say iodine, because a woman had a goiter, which is a lump, probably on her thyroid, on her neck. She also treats a trapper's dog with suturing, who she thinks was amorously trying to get at a skunk. (laughs) And remember, she's in direct competition with Murray McLeod, who has his own tent a mere feet away from hers. And he helps her with this dog because the trapper won't help at all. So she actually tackles the dog and rolls around on the dirt to finish suturing the dog, and Murray McLeod helps her. (laughs) It's very funny. But he's a little bit upset because the patient 
who he was hoping to get because he was dressed like a gentleman, the one who shares the story of Hillsboro, comes to her instead. And then we have Brianna, and I put in parentheses and her breasts and Roger. Brianna's been helping her mother at the clinic, but she's really grossed out by most of this stuff. She was really only there to be supportive and to talk to her mother while they were setting up. She is really not good with this kind of thing. It is not her calling whatsoever. And Claire, being sensitive to Brianna, eventually just tells her to boogie out, right? Uh, because she knows this isn't her deal. She can tell Brianna's really getting grossed out by some of the dental work that needs to be done. So I also put a link in about colonial dental care. And I looked on the American Dental Association, and there's really not that much information. It just talks about who did pioneering anything. But really, for the day, the best thing was for problems was to pull teeth and if there was abscesses to lance them, that kind of thing. Claire actually has her patient, Mr. Goodwin, you know, kind of swish with whiskey, hold it in his mouth for a minute and then swallow because she was hoping it would not only clean his mouth, that it would disinfect it a little bit and cause numbing. And there was a pioneer, I think it was in 1837, I think it was, I need to look, who started scraping the teeth to get all the plaque off of them. And that's something that we still do today when we go and get our teeth cleaned. Dentistry and its advancements, <laughs> I'm sorry for any dental assistants or dentists or oral surgeons, I see some very close relations to what has come from the past. And it's really still a very young medicine system, even though it's the second most popular medicine system in the country, I learned. It's its own specialty, of course. So there you have it. But there's some interesting things to read about how it came about and talking about teeth being extracted and then made into dentures for other people. It kind of made me gag a little bit. I mean, I totally get it, but I think I'd rather have mine carved out of wood or something else if I needed them then. I mean, false teeth, dentures, and implants have come like a million miles in comparison to what they were. But a lot of the treatments are essentially the same. If you have a cavity, you put something in it, right? You put a filler in it. And hoping that that's that and you won't need to do anything else and the cavity is done and you're not going to need a root canal or you pull the tooth. You should see me shrugging. Oh, yeah. And now you can get things called crowns. I'm the proud owner of two. Where I put a false tooth over your own tooth that's left and it, your own tooth is the anchor, even if your tooth could not be utilized by itself anymore. And that is awesome because you're not going to get that tooth pulled and then have a space and have other issues come up. Or you're not going to require a bridge or an implant. Implants are interesting. I'm going to take a side note because I think about in 200 years, or 400 years when our bodies are found and they're going to find people with like steel posts in their mouth that had, they're going to be like, what were they doing? What was their dentistry like? (laughs) They were barbarians. (laughs) So it's a really evolving science and it's a really evolving medicine system. And it would be really cool if at some point we could actually grow artificial teeth and then put them in people's heads as like, implants when you have one removed. Would that be great? Or if you could save the roots and add another tooth and it would attach to it? I know. (laughs) Total science fiction. But you never know. So all that to say, I did put a link in for Colonial Dental Care. It's quite fascinating. Another side note, I could never be a dentist, nor could I be a podiatrist. Mm. Claire does both of those things (laughs) in the 18th century. I'd be like, yeah, no. 
then I would push my limits of capability. And one of the things that people who are readers of Outlander, listeners of the podcast, especially when they're doctors, I will say that they are medical doctors, they really have a hard time with Claire's expanse of knowledge and her abilities to perform all sorts of things. Like, of course, that she's a general surgeon in the 20th century, but she's not a brain surgeon. She's not a cardiac surgeon, right? She doesn't do some of those other things. And so I really don't think she would have gotten extensive training in dentistry because by the time she did her medical training, dentistry was its own separate specialty already. It started on its own along with Western medicine. As far as I can tell, I mean, barbers did some dental work, didn't they? (laughs) It started out separate from Western medicine, at least from my quick research. So if I'm wrong, you know where to find me. Contact at adramofoutlander.com or 719-425-9444. And I love your feedback, even the criticism, especially the criticisms, because I don't like messing up. And if I do, let me know. But I'm pretty sure they developed simultaneously, but not quite together. Okay. And, okay, so when we talk about Claire's clinic patients, we've already talked about the trapper and the dog. I think that was just a cute little aside, but I don't think it went into any sort of storytelling importance. But when Mr. Goodwin, the gentleman, sits down in front of her, he has quite a few injuries And the injuries came from the Hillsborough riots. Oh, it's pretty terrible. (laughs) This man has all sorts of injuries. He's got broken bones. He's got a tooth that got busted out. He has incredible things that are going on with him. But he was first complaining chiefly about a pain in his arm. And she's looking all over him and thinking, whoa, (laughs) what in the heck happened to this guy? And upon really looking at him, she thinks that his dislocated elbow had reduced itself, but it had torn the tendon and caught it between the ulcronium process, and the head of the ulna. So every time he moved his arm, he was getting this massive pain. I can only imagine, I mean, you're talking like excruciating tendonitis. And so she wants to release that tendon so that it can heal, but where the man is not going to be in incredible pain, okay? So she had seen all these bruises on him, and she thinks these are all self-defense injuries. (laughs) And so she starts asking him what happened. And here's what he says back to her. "'Twas a battle indeed, Mrs. Fraser," he replied, "'and yet no fight of my own. "'A matter of misfortune, rather, "'being in the wrong place at the wrong time, "'as you might say, still. "'He closed the squinting eye and reflex "'as I touched the scar. "'An artless job by whoever had stitched it, "'but cleanly healed. So she goes on to ask him what happened, and he tells her that he was in Hillsborough, and his wife told him to stay in the house, but he wanted to go file a complaint, not anything to do with the regulators. He was filing a totally separate complaint, and he decided to go anyway. So Claire says something so funny where she says, they do say that curiosity killed the cat because he refused to stay home at his wife's urgings. So Claire, looking at his face, really thinks that some teeth were broken, and she sees that two had been knocked out, well, one only partially, and she wants to really help with him to get that to heal. So 
This is where Brianna gets totally grossed out from all the plaque and the color is really yellow and the guy chews tobacco black. I'm really surprised in the history of things where people tried to smell good. Like when they didn't wash frequently, they perfumed and powdered and etc. Like why people didn't think about brushing their damn teeth. That is so interesting to me. And in the reading about the early dentistry, there was something that said that people would take cloths and rub it on there. It just wasn't okay to do at the table. You didn't do it in sight of other people. It was considered really gross and just socially unacceptable. And there was a picture from a small brush for the teeth, very similar to what ours looks like now without a handle. That was from China in the mid-1800s. But in the whole history of humankind, why didn't someone figure out to brush the teeth? I have no idea. People must just have smelled nasty breath all the time, like dragon breath. (laughs) That is one thing that is really surprising to me. I mean, I know that people couldn't bathe easily like we do with our running water, you know, and our instant hot. But that, that one completely throws me for a loop. Now, I've not done a global search for history of dental hygiene in the world. That'd be a fascinating topic. Because I'm I'm thinking there had to be some cultures that actually brushed their teeth and it was just a lost art as time went by. It like didn't get passed down when that civilization fell. I mean, it had to be. I mean, for goodness sake, the ancient Romans had running water. They had all that piping. Yeah, they used lead, which made them a little bananas. But they had all of that technology. And we lost it all. I mean, poof, gone. So, I mean, the ancient Romans filled the freaking Colosseum full of enough water from the aqueducts and the plumbing that they had to wage ship battles in the middle of the Colosseum. That is some hella good technology. Anyway, I have to think that some culture somewhere knew to brush their teeth, even if they didn't know it was for health reasons, but just so their breath wouldn't be stinky and their teeth wouldn't be ugly. <laughs> that just baff- baffles me to no end. Anyway, I digress. You can tell where my hot spots are. <laughs> so she decides to help him with this, and he keeps going on to explain how he was going to go file a complaint, and he was on his way and there was a mob and he ends up getting caught up in it because his friend Edmund Fanning was in the midst of this melee that was going on. They were going in to trash his house and drag him out bodily. And I pulled up a source for this for Edmund Fanning and I put the link in the post notes Really interesting. So he was born in Long Island, New York in 1737. He was the son of a colonel. And he studied law at Yale University and attended King's College, Harvard, Dartmouth, and Oxford. Okay. This guy was a smarty pants. His legal studies fostered predilection for a Whiggish thought, a belief in the limitation of monarchical power and an increase in parliamentary power. But yeah, he was one of the king's men, right? So in 1759, Fanning moved to Hillsborough, North Carolina, and began a political career. He was friends with Lord William Tryon, the governor of the province of North Carolina, and helped him become a prestigious and profitable lawyer. He was appointed crown attorney in 1761, which is still a thing (laughs) in Britain, or the UK, rather, and developed a probate practice in Rowan County. And then he he received an appointment to the Salisbury District. In 1763, he became the clerk of the Superior Court of Orange County. He also gained an appointment as the Associate Justice of North Carolina, a position acquired when the presiding judge, Alfred Moore, publicly criticized the Stamp Act. Hmm. So, he had 
quite a few different things that he did, quite a few appointments. Sounds like he was a fast tracker, and he was also a colonel in the militia. Now, here's where things get interesting for Fanning. The North Carolina regulators believed Fanning epitomized political corruption. By the way, this is from NorthCarolinaHistory.org. Okay. They accused Fanning of embezzlement and abuse of tax collection. Although a 1724 act detailed that courts charge fees for their services. So they demanded documentation concerning the construction of the Tryon Palace in New Bern and opposed crown actions they believed to be unnecessary for their welfare. So he opposed the regulator rebellion, of course. But the interesting part of this is Governor Tryon allowed Fanning to be tried for extortion. Huh. So was he just giving the people, the regulators, a little nibble? So that was in 1768. So Judge Moore ruled that the court required substantial information to discharge Fanning, and according to common law, the evidence against Fanning did not meet the level of certainty required. So then Fanning went on to file a writ of error and appeal to the Temple in London to acquit him. So this all led to try and assembling a council in New Bern to plan ways to gather support for crown policies in the backlands. The reason I'm reading all of this to you is because it really gives some a little more weight and heaviness to what happened in Hillsboro. Now, I'm going to pop in, do a little side note on the TV show. They were showing a lot of information about the regulators, but we didn't really get much information on why. They did talk about the palace. And they did talk about, you know, things like they thought it was illegal ways of obtaining money that they were corrupt and wrong, right? So we heard a little bit about that, but we haven't really heard about Edmund Fanning. We haven't heard much of the detail. Now, of course, that's maybe going to happen in the TV show. We don't know. All we know is like now they want Murtaugh dead, yeah? But he, what has he really done? <laughs> He's just talking about it. He hasn't really committed any act. So regardless, like Fanning showed his loyalty to the crown, and that was that. But the regulators and the opposition to Trine and Fanning continued. And... Um, Herman Husband, who we have met in the show, and he's in the books, he's the Quaker. So he actually affronted Fanning and challenged his legalistic Whig views. So then they say matters got even worse when a regulator mob assaulted Fanning and vandalized and torched his Hillsborough home. As evidenced by Husband's a fan for Fanning and a touchstone for Tryon, Fanning's association with the royal governor and alleged malfeasance had provoked many Piedmont colonists. And then Fanning goes on to lose some positions that he, or appointments that he wanted, but ultimately he followed Tryon to New York and he was wounded twice during the American War, American Revolution, and appointed as a colonel in the British Army. And he also was awarded a combat position later as Surveyor General of New York. And after the American Revolution failed to be won by the British, he fled to Nova Scotia, got married, and became the lieutenant governor. And the lieutenant governor for Prince Edward Island. So he really had... A pretty prestigious career, all in all. However, he was financially destitute. So when Lord Tryon died, Governor Tryon, he left part of his money to Fanning. Very interesting, who died in 1808. Wow, so that put him at... 
71 years old. So he lived a long time and had quite a few adventures. And he left behind a daughter and a wife. <laughs> so the source for this material for NorthCarolinaHistory.org um, is a book by Edward C. Brothers, The Regulators, North Carolina Taxpayers Take Arms Against the Governing Elite, American Illustrated History, and a, a couple other books. That's the prime one. So there you have it. The link is in the podcast notes. I hope you didn't fall asleep. I find it really interesting when we're dealing with real people, because it is historical fiction in part, that we really get to see more the background of the story and the meaningfulness of it when we look at who those people were. And so this man, the fictitious Mr. Goodwin, was friends with Fanning, regardless of how angry other people were. (laughs) So at this point, Claire didn't know that Fanning wasn't killed in the process. She hadn't heard, but he was pretty well smacked around and left in the dirt. And all in all, while this is going on, after she fixes his mouth, she's fixing his arm while he is talking. So one of the interesting things that comes out of this conversation is that he says, his bottom line is, believe me, mom, I hope folk here are moved to give up the names of the rioters, that they may be justly punished for such barbarous work. But were I to see here the fellow who struck me, I shouldn't be inclined to surrender him to the governor's justice. Indeed, I should not. Um... We don't find out why. Huh. Pretty interesting. Oh, no, now, I'm sorry, I had it backwards. Now she's going to work on his tooth. So why would he not do anything? Is he so easy to forgive? Does he understand that Fanning made enemies as well as allies and was such a fast tracker? Hmm. Or does he just not want to get involved and get more hurt? It sounds like he had, he would have had lasting injury, even though he would recover. I mean, geez, he lost two teeth. (laughs) So this is the point where Claire sends Brianna away. And so what has Claire done here? She sutured a dog, which is awesome. And in this time period, Like midwives would also help farm animals be born and they would help with all kinds of other smaller medical issues. And so Claire being the healer, even though, yes, we know what she does in the 20th, she would also treat animals if necessary. (laughs) But a mangy dog, he wasn't really mangy. He was just an injured dog. (laughs) And the goiter, and here we see the dental work and the relocation and releasing of that tendon. All right. So the point of that section is the fact that we get more backstory, right? And that's why it's important. And she also won a patient, even though Murray McLeod's annoyed. <laughs> So that's it for Claire. That's it for McLeod. And now we move away from that and we're getting into the meat and bones of Roger and Brianna. We saw at the end of chapter five that Roger was kind of waiting off to the side a little bit in the distance and he stepped out from the bushes, and he sees her, and they just light upon each other. And Claire finishes her business. So 
in the book, it's kind of the slow build toward what's going on with the regulators. First, we had the regiment show up and read that letter. And then we had the problem with the thief taker, right? And then we saw a couple of other people who were involved who are now gone. They like, pretty sure they boogied out or they're boogieing out by evening. So we're getting this kind of slow picture of what's going on. And now what's going to be expected of Jamie and that he has, he's going to have to build this a militia at some point to deal with this because we know the back country, well, it had its issues and the regulators wanting some kind of justice as part of that. So chapter six, you know, it starts out with Roger who was standing at that edge and he was watching Brianna you know, she was pounding herbs and measuring liquids and tearing bandages and doing all the things, right? And I love where he says, strong in the wrists. He thought with a faintly disturbing memory of Estella and Dickens's great expectations. <laughs> I will tell you, I am not a Dickens fan. I actually hate Dickens. And the funny thing about it is, is I have read most of Dickens' books because when I was coming up in school... It was required reading. We were beat to death with Dickens. <laughs> and I know some of you love Dickens. And the funny thing is how Diana Gabaldon writes the Outlander books and other books in the series, her descriptions don't bother me in the way that Dickens' descriptions bother me. I find him just to be infuriating. And I just lose track of what's going on because of his descriptions. I don't know what the difference is, but not for me. So Roger, as he's watching, he's noticing other people are taking notice. Women are taking notice. Men are taking notice. Like they're taking more positive notice than the women. <laughs> so she's in the books. She's very striking. She's about six feet tall. She has red hair. She's not built daintily at all. And just to reframe what book Claire looks like. She's about five, six. And I, as, per the description in the books, she really has sort of a classic English build. She has narrower shoulders. She's got nice bosoms and she's got a smaller waist and she's got a booty on her. Okay. So, and she's probably around what did, I think in one of the books it said she was around 120 pounds, 130 pounds. So she's thin for her height, but she's not thin for the time. Like she would be considered somewhat curvy for the time to actually have a booty on her, right? I think that's quite thin for <laughs> five, six being 120 pounds, 125 pounds. But it also depends on her build. If she's very finely built, which it sounds like she is in the books, that's, you know, it's very different than somebody who's thick, you know, thicker built and is 120 or 130 pounds where they just have more bony structure and they're not built small. So Brianna is not built small. She is built like a Viking ancestor of hers. You know, she's tall. She's broad. She's not necessarily super graceful. And Claire has more of that about her. So Claire being finely framed, her weighing 120, 125 pounds, she actually has some meat on her bones and the girl's going to have a nice booty, right? So that's why I'm trying to give that picture back to you, because many of you are going to have Katrina Balfe in your mind as Claire, who's like 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 and very thin and small framed, but tall. And then you have the visage of Sophie Skelton, who is, what, 5'8", 5'9", I think she's 5'9". I just 
It's hard for me to look things up when I'm recording. So we have her, who's slightly taller than average height, or taller than average height, but she's not tall like Jamie tall, and she's very finely built. Sophie Skelton was a ballerina, dancer. Okay, so don't roast me if I was wrong about ballerina. That just popped out, but I know she was a dancer. So she's built much more small. Like, if you could swap their builds, <laughs> their heights, that would make more sense to me, except that Katrina Balfe is thin, thin. That's just how she's made. So imagine Katrina Balfe built like a Viking warrior. There you go. <laughs> but she's very noticeable. And she has this modern Massachusetts accent. And the thing struck me the other day as another sidebar. Sorry. This is why I take notes, but then I can brain squirrel. Is that Claire... Claire's English accent would have been completely bizarre. Nobody sounded like her. The Southern accent of today is very closely aligned to what the English accent sounded like 200 years ago. And I've researched it a bit because I love this stuff. And there's one little teeny tiny village that has had the same accent. There's been very little access to them. They have stayed very true to who they are in the last hundreds of years. They've been around since the 1600s and they hailed from England. So that's the accent that they probably had, which sounds distinctly like a Southern accent, I mean, it's different, of course, because of the region, but Claire would have sounded patently bizarre. They would not have pegged her for an English woman because she wouldn't have sounded like them. The modern accent that we consider like the Southern English accent is not what people sounded like. And they also didn't sound like they were from the north of England or the west of England or they didn't sound like they do now. They've all developed separately from us because of the American Revolution and people didn't travel a lot, even though they started with the same sounds. So that just struck me hilarious as I was driving the other day and I'm like, we are so quick just to dive into the idea that she would not be totally out of step and sound very strange, but she would. The funny thing is, in the book, it was pointed out that Roger sounded very strange to Scottish people because he had a modern accent. But we'd never, ever discuss that about Claire. So she'd be the one who sounds like the, <laughs> the modern English woman. And sound like nobody else. Brianna's accent would probably sound less weird than Claire's. Uh, that dumbfounded me for a second and I laughed. I'm like, all these years, all these podcasts, and it never consciously dawned on me because we just hear it. And we're so used to in movies, etc. Of course... We have the English accent, but that's not what it would have sounded like 200 years ago. So all the shows and all the TV movie movies and all the theater movies, uh, nobody sounded like that. <laughs> I would love if there was some kind of, I don't know if it's the right word, forensic. Oh, gosh, what word am I looking for? Language expert could come up and really construct the accent to what it really, I mean, sounded like and go through and read something from that time period so we would have a sense of what it sounded like in the southern colonies. I think that would be fascinating. Anyway, <laughs> that was a really far step outside of what we were talking about. But again, that's one of the things I love about going through the books 
they really kind of lead down massive rabbit trails, which I happen to be very fond of. Okay, so Claire would have sounded very weird and probably not like an English Sassanac at all. <laughs> so anyhow, we can just suspend belief and, or suspend disbelief, I mean, and move forward from here. <laughs> okay. So Roger is sitting here and watching her, and he's feeling this deep, deep sense of ownership and possession over her. Now, before everybody gets their panties in a wad over this, we do feel that sense of possession. When you love somebody and you have passion for them, we totally feel that. Now, it can come out in super inappropriate controlling ways, and it can come out as jealousy but one of the positive things that it comes out is someone being protective of you, taking care of you, having your best interest at heart, helping you succeed, loving you how you want to be loved, caring about what you think, say, and do, right? <laughs> There's a lot of positives to that. But he has this sense of, yes, will she come, drop everything and come to me when she sees me? Yes, and she did. But he would do the same for her. That makes us feel so loved and so connected, but they're things that we really don't say out loud very much, lest they be misconstrued. But I like that because he has this just depth of fierceness for her. And I'm afraid we haven't gotten that in the TV show. I'll stop talking about the TV show here in a sec. But we haven't gotten that development. So I hope we see more of that and care about the TV characters. Because I'm reading about book Brianna and Roger, and I'm like, oh, this is why I adore them so much. I really feel like I'm back with my people. I'm back with my buddies. <laughs> and everything's okay. I mean, I love the show. There are things that I really miss. And if I didn't read the books, I don't know if I would have such a connect connection, excuse me, to some of the characters because the depth isn't there. The character development hasn't been there yet. And so why do I care? Okay. So she gets away and from her duties with her mother. <laughs> and they start talking. And what I love about this whole chapter is this really is exploring how they communicate, which is very effective, especially since you know how they got separated by that fight originally, that they have learned to really talk to each other and they've spent the time since Roger returned from the Mohawk village, really learning each other. And you can see that here, that there's been this great leaps and bounds of connection. And it's been a few months. Now their hand fasting was up in September. So that's something that's going to be talked about here as well. But what, how Brianna goes about things is interesting though. So she's going about feeling Roger out and going to talk to him about how scared she is about something by going into this whole diatribe like she did with her mother. Like she kind of takes the long route because she really wants to feel it out and know what she's talking about first. So she doesn't like the blood and guts. Roger says he whatever. He doesn't either. But she goes on to say that maybe it'd be a good thing to have a wife who could sew you up or pull your teeth out. I mean, it makes Claire super happy with what she does and Jamie, but it's not for them, okay? So he assures her he has what he wants in her, and but what about her? I mean, he's not really into the blood thing either. <laughs> 
Like Jamie's a man of blood and a fighter and all of those things. And she assures him that she does not think of him or want a bloody man like Jamie. And so now we're getting the distinction between the parents and the child and what defines like a Highland man and Roger, who's also a Highland man. And we're getting these distinct pictures of who they are on their own outside of Claire and Jamie. So they get into a sort of lighter part of conversation where she says that Jamie won't teach her bad words in Gaelic, but Marsley will tell her to say all the evil things in French, <laughs> which I thought was really cute. But he knows some French and they just kind of have a laugh. She happens to have a package in her hand, and this is where they start getting to the heart of what she really wants to talk about initially. And she says it's a wedding present, but she doesn't like it. She just has a look on her face of disdain, and she says it's embroidery silk. And he's like, and? That's nice. He's a historian, this man. Right? So him not understanding embroidery silk is interesting, but when I started looking up wedding shrouds, embroidery silk, uh, let's see, what's the other one called? Winding cloth. Really, there was very little information on it. Everything I could find harkened back to ancient Rome. But I could, where that's actually one of the um, births of bridal veils was that it was supposed to be long enough so you could be wrapped in it in case you died. So uh, I couldn't find a lot on it in Scottish tradition, but it was probably just a tradition of the time and I couldn't find much about it at all. So I have no link for you on that. So if any of you have any resources for the winding cloth, for the woman to like spin her own shroud and her husband's, let me know. That's part of tradition because I couldn't find anything. So he is trying to figure out what she means. And she says it's her wifely duty to sit down the morning after the wedding and start spinning cloth for my shroud. That way I'll have it woven and embroidered by the time I die in childbirth. And if I'm a fast worker, I'll have time to make you one too. Otherwise, your next wife will have to finish it. <laughs> that is pretty harsh. <laughs> and this really had me go looking up the historical facts about risks of childbirth. Now, I will tell you, I've researched this pretty extensively on my own because I'm a midwife. But there's really lacking detail. There's not a lot of good records. We do know that in the childbearing year, quite a few women died. And there were some primary re reasons why women died in labor or after, like Geneva Dunsany with a hemorrhage. There could have been an obstruction of labor that caused the mother and baby to die. One said convulsions, which I think would have been eclampsia or escalating preeclampsia that was undiagnosed, an infection. Infection is the big mama. Anyway, so we're going really going through these things. Now, interestingly enough for Brianna and for childbirth practices on the ridge, Claire knows how to not infect women. Claire knows how to manage hemorrhage, whether it's through herbal medicines or it's through bimanual compression, doing other things. Claire knows how to suture women effectively and make her own sutures and to wash her hands and have clean instruments. So the main things that are going to be problematic are not going to happen. She also could probably diagnose preeclampsia, but there's not a damn thing she could do about it except try and induce someone's labor, which is still dangerous today, mind you, even though it seems controlled in the hospital environment. But there are definitely risk factors to things that she would use, even though 
the things that are used commonly today, if you're trying to do a natural induction, you can do them safely, but you have to be careful because you don't know how certain things are going to interact. So for Brianna, as long as she stays near her mother having babies, she's probably fairly safe unless she has a major obstruction of labor or like develop preeclampsia because she could die from that because there'd be no treatment at all for it if they couldn't get the baby delivered in time for her body to recover because it does kill women still today. And the other thing could be gestational diabetes if it got bad enough, but I haven't seen a lot written about that for prior times. So there's definite risk factors. And right now in the United States of America, we are in a massive crisis and the maternal morbidity and mortality and infant or newborn mortality is totally, uh, it's been on the rise. And a lot of that has to do with our excessive use of intervention. And the other part of it is, is what we call prenatal care. Frankly, for 98% of women, 97% of women in this country is just crap. It's total garbage. You can't just take vitals and surveil baby and... Do you have any questions and do a few tests and call it a day? There's so much more about it and not listening to women when they say things, when they've had a baby, sending them home when they're still really sick. I mean, there's a lot involved, but primarily what we saw was when uh, men started getting super involved in birth is that we start, we saw a huge rise in postpartum fever. My first mother-in-law, actually, her mother actually died after she was born from postpartum infection that was pretty sure from dirty hands or instruments. So yeah, doctor came to the house and there was probably, it was probably from dirty instruments. From by the time frame she was born, that would have absolutely been reasonable, even though there were some physicians who knew if they cleaned the instruments or who believed, even if they didn't understand why, that if you wash them, cleaned things that you would and wash your hands, that you would reduce infection. But people didn't listen to him at the time. Okay. Hmm. So it's very difficult to actually ascertain exactly what the statistics were. But I did post a link of history of childbirth in America that had sources attached to it that made sense. And you could actually go, okay. Now, it's a little bit of a skewed article, even though it has reference material and is well written. It's, we don't have good data, truthfully, from before. The only data we have is moving forward when Western medicine was on the rise and we were developing what we call doctors and science as we know it today in the westernized world. So that's when data really started being collected much better. We just didn't, midwives didn't collect data hardly at all. There was some collection of data, but not much. And there is a little skew on this about saying no formal training. There are probably a lot of midwives who trained by the preceptorship and they knew there's, they were probably many who are very well skilled. And just because someone goes to medical school and graduates and gets their license doesn't mean they're skilled at being a doctor. So I, I don't like the black and white sweeping, oh, this was just so much better. <laughs> Sorry, after we tried to kill so many of you when we went to the hospital system. <laughs> uh, oh, but now it's a lot better. So we have to be really careful of both taking a romantic view of history because it was very unsafe. And by things I'm reading, it could have been, it's come down by half or more, you know, in the span of like the late 18th century to the early 20th century. I mean, it started to decline once we figured things out, but it went on a massive rise for a while, even more so, and then began to drop. 
So we can't romanticize the past and be like, oh, everything was great. No, we have to look at their diet, stress level, conditions, etc. But it was a pretty constant number before what we call medical doctors got involved and there was a lot of quote experimentation kind of things and learning and that's and then the rates drastically rose and then they began to fall once we got those things figured out but it was a pretty constant rate of morbidity and mortality before that that's all i can tell you again there just wasn't well documented but we have a, a huge increase in our country now, and it's very problematic. And there's a reason why women are terrified to have babies today, or when the largest reasons why women died before mainly have hemorrhage and infection. We shouldn't really see those. Women shouldn't be dying of that. Like we really do know our stuff, and we know how to not only help prevent them, but not make them happen not cause them. But women are terrified. And if you want to pick my brain about that, there's a lot of good reasons for that. But it's not mainly because of the historic reasons why women were scared. And this is where we're having Brianna talk about that. And before we get there, though, we're like, er, that's the beginning of this conversation that they're having. And Roger's just trying to encourage her. You know, some people call this mansplaining, which I really hate that term because I don't like to use any derogatory terms toward people. And I think it's men trying to tell you something, but they really don't understand what they don't know. But they keep trying to explain it to you from their vantage point when their vantage point is not what matters in the conversation. So <laughs> she's trying to talk to Roger and he's trying to say, well, so-and-so had this many babies and so-and-so did. Yes, that's experiential data, but a lot of women died. A lot of children died. And every baby that women had, if they had an average like seven, eight babies in that time period, your risks of dying were pretty freaking high in childbirth. Like Jamie's mom. She had plenty of babies, fine, and then died after one of them. So just because you had five babies before doesn't mean the sixth labor and delivery, you wouldn't die. So it is hard. And it's a really, it's a harsh reality. And many women still face this around the globe. Unfortunately, in our country, women face it too, and they shouldn't in our modern society. But this is still a very real concern around the entire globe, because we are an earth full of people, not just westernized countries. And it makes me step back and pause. And I just applaud the midwives, the well-skilled, well-trained midwives who are going into other countries and helping them build safer systems for their mothers. That's, you know, and help incorporate anything that can be life-saving and improving. And it's amazing what's being done through the process of sending midwives to developing countries. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> And so Roger's bottom line is, you have no need to fear hen. You've had no trouble with Jemmy, I. I love, love, love the use of hen. I think women are definitely like hens when I sit and watch the chickens at friends in friends' backyards. They crack me up to no end. They definitely are like women. <laughs> and I think it's the most endearing thing to call someone. And I have a Scottish friend who calls me hen, and it makes me, like, smile really hard. So this does not sit well with Brianna. She's trying to get to something, right? And he's just like, it's fine, babe. You're good. But she's like, that's not it. Hold up. <laughs> so now, you know, she's... And he's trying to figure out what she's getting at here. So he asks her if she's willing to have a next time. Now, birth control, as we discussed, is pretty precarious. It's still really tough today. 55% of pregnancies are unintended. So even with all of our amazing birth control options, or fertility control options, I wish it would be called, they fail 
and people fail to use them. <laughs> so this at this time frame, that she doesn't even have an option of like an IUD, right? Which would be great. So now we're getting into some deliberate territory here because all the things that Claire was thinking when they, when she and Brianna were having that conversation, when they were setting up and Claire realized that Roger may want a child of his own. So why does Brianna not want to have a child, but all the implications of having another child, what that would mean? Because Claire had to leave her child to come to the 18th century. So now we're seeing the other side of that conversation and this with Brianna and Roger, like it's coming to full circle. She talked to her mother and now she's talking to him. And there's all these little realizations and implications that are coming to the surface. So, and so he basically offers celibacy. And what I said on my paperwork, I said, the path to sexual engagement on the heels of discussing celibacy. <laughs> this is the prime example that, yeah, Probably not a good option when you get that fire in your belly for somebody or your nether parts. <laughs> so they're having this conversation. It's really funny because if you just took out the topic of celibacy or put any other topic in there, I mean, they're like totally getting all hot and bothered while discussing this. So this is actually really sexy. And it's really engaging when you're reading it about how they're interacting with each other and their body language. And it's lovely. Now, remember, though, Bran is still a lactating mother. And that's why I put and her breasts, because they definitely play a part in here. This is not a section that Diana Gabble don't put like the whole breast milk sexual play in here. I know some people are like, oh, my God, she has a fetish for that. No, it was probably just something she enjoyed with her husband or her husband enjoyed with her. And I think it's really normalizing something that's very normal that happens between a lot of couples. <laughs> so I, that's all. But it's it's very funny. But her breasts are definitely prominent in this scene. So Roger, like, tries to pull away and do the right thing because now he's got to worry about her and worry about her every time they have sex. Now it's in his head. Now he's like, oh, crap. This is a hell of a bigger thing than just having sex, right? Or having another baby. So he tries to pull away, but she grabs under his kilt. And he lost all power of speech, it says. <laughs> and then she says, once more before we quit, for old time's sake. Hence, the title of the chapter. So mind you, it is raining outside. They're in the bushes or whatever. <laughs> They're kind of in an off-the-beaten-path spot. But people are everywhere. I guess you don't have much of an option, though. It's not like they had a, even a camper to go to, right? So there's the after description, and now he feels so apologetic. Roger is such a lovely man. Now he feels guilty. It's really funny because he's having Presbyterian guilt. <laughs> Brad is not guilty at all. She's like, well... What's done is done. <laughs> so he apologizes. And here's the point that I wanted to get to. She says, it's okay. It's only six months and I'm still nursing Jemmy. It's, I mean, I think it's still safe. But for how much longer, she wondered. Little jolts of desire still shot through her mingled with spurts of dread. I love the gravity that Diana writes about the sexual act, there could be grave consequences here. And I love the meaningfulness that she puts to that. It's not just about a couple having sex. It's just not that physical bonding and intimacy. There could be really harsh outcomes for this. And I like that we get to see it in its nuts and bolts and we get to confront it outside of ourselves, but we, I, I love that because that really speaks to reality. I know women who should patently never get pregnant because of health issues, and it could literally kill them to get pregnant. And I'm like, please, can your husband please go get a vasectomy? <laughs> please go get your tubes tied. Like, 
and they and when they don't do something, I panic for them because it's grave <laughs> and it's serious. And I'm like, why won't you do something about this? Yes, there are risks to getting your tubes tied. There are risks to vasectomies, but there are more risks to going through a pregnancy and childbirth and postpartum for some women than the other things that are available. So I did put um, a link in, two links in for breastfeeding and fertility and breastfeeding as birth control. And really at this, she has spent a lot of time away from her baby. So if she's spending time away from like hand expressing and leaving milk for him and spending time away from him, she is not covered. <laughs> not very well, but doesn't sound like she's had her cycle back. So I'm just going to put a quick little tidbit in because everyone doesn't want to hear about menstrual periods and ovulation, but I have to do my little PSA. So generally, it's a low percentage of women who are ovulating at the six-month point, but when you get your first period, it goes up more, then your fertility comes back by the second period pretty high, about 75% if you're nursing. And for someone who's not breastfeeding their baby and they are using formula after the second period, it's pretty serious fertility comes back, like more than 80%. So it is really important to, especially if you're not breastfeeding or if you're breastfeeding, but you're spending lengthy time away from your baby and you're having to pump or baby is not sleeping near you, baby's eating a lot of solid foods, or baby's getting a mix of breastfeeding and formula bottles, then your fertility is coming back way earlier. And there's a way to do it so you can guard your fertility for quite a long time. But once a woman's menstrual cycle comes back, usually by the second cycle, she's pretty fertile breastfeeding or not. So that's my PSA. So she's in the, in the zone where it's getting iffy, unless she's breastfeeding throughout the night as well, Brianna's fertility is coming. And so she's going to need to take them seeds or use a sponge and the oil and really do something more. Or he's just going to have to do the whole coitus interruptus thing every single time. But you know, when you don't, like I said, wash between, <laughs> just takes one really motivated sperm. Okay. So I did put links in there because I think they are fascinating and interesting. And there's a lot of myths surrounding breastfeeding and fertility. And the thing is, Claire said she thinks she'd be protected. However, in that time period where Claire would have gone through her training, we didn't know hardly anything. We had gone through a revolution away from breastfeeding where during Claire's training, it was almost like zero women breastfed. That was just about the time when she left and went back to the 18th is that there was a resurgence of breastfeeding. Well, Leche League was soon to be formed, if not just about formed at that time period. So we were just now seeing women breastfeeding again. Women didn't breastfeed. They were told that formula was awesome. And it was a whole mess when it came to feeding babies in our country. It just went off the rails. And we are still recovering from that 100 years later. Our breastfeeding rates are still very low to what they should be. And the length of breastfeeding is very low to what it should be. And I don't want any hate mail about that. I work with women all the time and I help them do whatever they need to do. If they breastfeed for six weeks while they're on maternity leave and then slowly wean, if they breastfeed for two years, they, whatever their goals are, I will help them with that. But it's really a tragedy in our country what happened, and that was all in the name of science. So science constantly changes. It is not a fixed thing. It is not a static thing. I mean, 100 years ago, we thought, you know, we were told that cigarette smoking was safe and good for you. So if you could see my face right now. Okay. So she's on the edge of being safe and she's young. So she's going to be fertile myrtle. So yeah, hopefully she'll do all the things. 
<laughs> and at this point in her breastfeeding relationship with the baby, she she should start being able to see signs and symptoms to actually doing like natural family planning. But it's going to be really hard to track in their day-to-day -day life and how they do things. It's not quite like now where you have a period tracker. But she could actually watch for signs and symptoms and learn her body and know kind of when her green week is. So she could try not to get pregnant. But that's not always accurate either because sometimes we ovulate later or we double ovulate because what he went on a, I don't know, went on a hunting trip. And he came back and she's like, bam, another egg. We don't know. Okay. So, you know, he's really kind of struggling with this whole thing. And so is she. She's like, celibacy? Like, this isn't going to work. When the feel of him, the smell of him, the memory of the last few minutes made her want to knock him flat in the leaves and do it all again. When tenderness for him welled up in her like the milk that rushed unbidden to her breasts. Like, that's Brianna thinking about celibacy. They've opened Pandora's box and they're not going back. <laughs> And she's hoping that as she's feeling her full breasts. Oh, another side note about that is that if you have an orgasm, you have a letdown. So this poor lady's breasts are just killing her because there's no baby there to take care of it. But she's hoping that it guarantees her safety for a little while. So she's noticing something's kind of amiss with Roger. And he says to her, that they aren't actually married at the moment because the hand fasting wore off already. And she's like, well, of course not. The wedding's not till tonight. <laughs> Speaking of which. And then she gets sidetracked by looking at, he's a mess. He has dirt on his coat. Like they just flung each other into the weeds and got at it. And she looks like she's been in a fight also. <laughs> but then she really looks at him and, and says, you know, you think it matters that they're not married because they were married. They're married. They have a covenant. And she doesn't believe that that's what he's really saying. What Roger is getting at now that he's had that realization of the risks of pregnancy and birth, or that he hadn't really thought about it. And that she's right to be afraid. And he, I love the lines that are put in here. I want you, Bree, more than I can say. It's only that I was thinking of what we just did and how fine it was and realizing that I'll maybe, no, I will be risking your life if I keep on doing it. But damned if I want to stop. The small strands of dread had coalesced into a cold snake that ran down her backbone and coiled deep in her belly, twisting around her womb. She knew what he wanted, and it wasn't only the thing they just shared, powerful as that was, knowing what he wanted, though, and why. How could she hesitate to give it to him, a child? Yeah. Well, it's too late to worry about that, I think. I want you, Roger. <laughs> so all her worries, then they have great sex, and then now he gets to reflect and worry about it. And his response is also fabulous. Oh, God, Bree. I want to tell you that I'll keep you safe, save you, and Jemmy from anything that might threaten you, ever. It's a terrible thing to think it might be me that would be the threat, that I could kill you with my love. But it's true. Man, I wish people had that, like, sense of, you know, the ownership of <laughs> our sexuality today. But that's amazing. And I think that really help, will help them form their idea of what their fertility means and how they're going to work together as a couple to be as safe as possible and to minimize the risk of her getting pregnant. And I think that can really bring a couple together. I know many Catholic couples, and they do natural family planning, and it really has brought them together as a couple. And I actually counsel my midwifery client couples to work together. It's their fertility. It's not her fertility. 
It's their fertility. She can't get pregnant unless he's, you know, having an orgasm in her. So, well, generally speaking, you know what I mean. I'm not talking about extraneous circumstances, but it's their fertility. It's not just on her. And I talked to them about how they work together and how they make it as a couple commitment. That's part of my postpartum conversations because I really don't want to see a client back in my office three months postpartum pregnant again, four months postpartum, six months postpartum. I don't. I want her to be able to recover, them to find their new normal, and the baby to be the baby when it, until it's time to have another one if they choose to. So I do counsel that pretty heavily to make it part of their marital and couple commitment or partner commitment that they together are responsible for the fertility. And I think it really grows incredible intimacy between couples and a foundation of trust and faith in each other. And it's a beautiful bonding um, process. So there you go. And I think for Roger and Brianna, this is a foundation to that. (laughs) And this little part starts to come to a close when he says, you know what Ronnie Sinclair said to me last night? He was watching you bend down to pick up a stick of wood for the fire, and he sighed and said, you can how to pick a good lass, Mackenzie. Start at the bottom and work your way up. Oof. (laughs) He recoiled laughing as she slugged him. (laughs) Yes, she has fine physical assets as well. (laughs) And then she brings the elephant in the room out. You want a baby, don't you? One you know is yours. And he just said, I don't mean. But she says she understands. And this is another beautiful piece of writing. She had not one loving father, but two, a mother who had loved her beyond the bounds of space and times. The Murrays of Lali Brachet that unexpected gift of family, and most of all her son, her flesh, her blood, a small and trusting weight that anchored her firmly to the universe. But Roger was an orphan, alone in the world for such a long time. His parents gone before he knew them, his old uncle dead. He had no one to claim him, no one to love him for the sake only of his flesh and bone, no one save her. Little wonder if he hungered for the certainty she held in her arms when she nursed her child." to be long, to be owned by someone, not in the sense of monetary or actual ownership. You know what I mean? To have that sense of belonging. Like I am my husband's. I'm not his property, but I am his and he is mine. Even though we, either of us is free to walk away anytime. Even though we, on a daily basis, declare our marriage, you know, true and going forward because we're here and we work at it every single day. And it is a labor of love. But to have that, I have children, I have siblings, my parents are gone, his parents are gone, but we have nieces and nephews and we have that sense of belonging. And I could see being alone in the world and you'd want that. And to have something of yours would be really important too. And he hands her a little gift, and it's a little doll for Jemmy to chew on as he's teething. (laughs) And she looks at him and says, there'll be a next time. I can't say when, but there will. So she already knows that they will have a child, and that's the plan, but not yet. (laughs) So we move out of this kind of moment with them and into something completely different. You know, he's a wreck, his clothes are a wreck, and he's not sure what to do. (laughs) But he asks her to come and sit with him, and she wants to tell him something important. 
or him, sorry, he wants to tell her something important. And that is about Frank's letter to the reverend that he found. And do you want to make sure he tells her before their wedding? <sighs> well, come and sit with me a moment, Mrs. Mack. It's not important, but there's a small thing I wanted to tell you before the wedding. It's not important. It's a small thing. <laughs> When I was in Inverness, before I followed you through the stones, I spent some time trolling through the Reverend's bump, and I came across a letter to him written by your father, by Frank Randall, I mean. It's no great matter not now, but I thought, well, I thought perhaps there would be no secrets between us before we marry. Ah, there's that theme again. No secrets. I told your father about it last night, so let me tell you now. And then she says, again, tell me that again. So he repeated the letter as he'd memorized it word for word, as he told it the night before to Jamie Fraser. And Brianna is stunned to learn that the gravestone is a fake. Dad, Frank, had the Reverend make it and put it there in the kirkyard at St. Kilda? But Dot isn't, won't be, I mean, won't be under it? <laughs> yes, he did, and no, he won't. <laughs> He's involved. He, Frank Randall, that is, meant the stone as a sort of acknowledgement, I think, a debt owed to your father, your other father, I mean, Jamie. <laughs> what? So this is where the TV show and the book diverge. Because in the show, Frank told her that or she knows that Frank knew because of that night when she saw the death notice, et cetera, and she figured out later that Frank always knew. And she told Claire that Daddy knew, but we don't know to what extent. The rest of this, we don't know. This could still come out as part of something in the show, or it could be completely ignored. I hope not because of how important the acts of Frank become as time goes on. This is something where I hope kind of the love of Tobias Menzies, who is an amazing Frank, I hope it brings him back for voiceover or little cameos for some of these things. So they go on to explore this topic. You know, Brian is like, but we may have never have found it, but it could have just been a gesture. And Roger says, didn't Claire say he'd meant to bring you to England just before he was killed? Perhaps he meant to take you there, make sure you found it, then leave it to you and Claire what to do. Like there was something else going on with Frank the night he died. Like there was a plan and he planned for them to know about it. He planned for Claire to know about it. So after him, she could make a choice because this is at the point where Brianna was an adult. So he just bided his time until Brianna was an adult and then it was going to be revealed somehow, some way, even if it was him saying, hey, Claire, I found this in this kirkyard over here in Scotland when he had moved away from her and they divorced. So there was some plan there. And I hope if Diana Gabaldon writes a book about Frank that we really get to see that backstory because I'm immensely fascinated with what his process was and we can only use conjecture to figure out what he meant to do. And so she is trying to digest this with Roger, that Jamie survived Culloden. Wow. And Roger is quick to say, don't think you can blame him for not saying. It wasn't only selfish, you know. And she thinks it's selfish. She's shocked. No, think of it, Hen. The spruce was cold at his back, the bark of the fallen log damp under his hand. He loved your mother, I. I didn't want to risk losing her again. That's maybe selfish, but she was his wife first, after all. No one could blame him for not wanting to give her up to another man. But that's not all of it. What's the rest, then? Well, what if he had told her? There she was with you, a young child, and remember, neither of them would have thought that you might cross through the stones as well. She would have had to choose to stay with us or go with him to Jamie. Huge revelation to leave you behind, or to stay and live her life, knowing her Jamie was alive, maybe reachable, but out of reach. 
break her vows on purpose this time and abandon her child or live with yearning? I can't think that would have done your family's life much good. I see. Perhaps Frank was afraid to give her the choice, but he did save her and you from the pain of having to make it at least then. I wonder what her choice would have been if he had told her. This is that full circle thing coming around with Claire thinking about Brianna being able to leave and Roger being able to leave and go to the 20th to their own time because Jemmy would have his own life in the 18th, right? She would have stayed. She made the choice once, did she not? Jamie sent her back to keep you safe and she went. She would have known he wanted that and she would have stayed so long as you needed her. She wouldn't have gone back and even when she did, save that you insisted. You ken that well enough, surely. Yeah. And Brianna's still just sitting with this heavily. I guess you're right, but still to know he was alive and not try to reach him. And so Roger's thinking, if it were her choice, if it was the child or him, what would she choose? For how could any man force a choice like that on a woman whom he loved, even hypothetically, whether for her own sake or his own, he would not ask. And he tells her, I think it was an obligation, as I said, not just to Jamie or your mother, to you, if it, look, take we Jimmy, he's mine as much as you are, he always will be, but if I were the other man, if you were Stephen Bonnet, if I were Bonnet, if I knew that the child was mine, and yet he was being raised by a stranger, would I not want the child to know the truth sometime? So Brianna takes it totally differently, but Roger was thinking in a totally different way. And so she thinks that this means that Roger wants to tell Jemmy when he gets bigger. That's not what he means. He was saying, well, I'll get there in a second. She want, makes him promise first that he will never tell Jemmy that there's even a possibility. Celibacy is not my thing either. Like, if anything happens to her, you know. And if it does, promise me, Roger. So he promises her. But he clarifies what he means. And she says that Stephen Bonnet already knows. And this really sets a rock into Roger's belly. She explains that she thought maybe they were dead. And her father, Jamie, wanted her, urged her to find a way to forgive Bonnet. So she goes to do this with Lord John and she tells him because he's going to die the next day that the baby's his. And Roger takes this as, oh my gosh, she thinks the baby's his, but that's not it. She says that she only did it for that reason. I still think that's a weird thing, but and that this really makes Roger jealous of Bonnet. And he starts thinking in his head, something left? Something of him and what of me if I die tomorrow and I might, girl? Life's chancy here for me as well as you. What will be left of me? Tell me that. He's thinking that, but he doesn't say it. And he wouldn't ask it. And he would never say it out loud. And he thinks to himself, if there was a true marriage between them, then Jem was the child of it, no matter the circumstances of his birth. But Roger can't help himself and says, so you were sure the child was his, but she didn't mean it. And she says, he was going to die. I wanted to give him some comfort, not tell him my life story. It wasn't any of his goddamn business to hear about you or a wedding night or damn you, Roger. It's interesting that she's mad at him. <laughs> and she said those things. I don't know if she feels guilt of it, but I think it's okay for Roger to express this. They mean they get over it quickly. And he apologizes and he says it's none of his business, but it's really hard. And she agrees that there shouldn't be any secrets between them. And she says, and you were right, but when you tell a secret, sometimes there's another one behind it, isn't there? But at this point, before they can discuss this further, some people come upon them and they kind of make fun of their dishevelment, no, realize they've been rolling in the hay before their wedding. And 
They make some jokes. They give Brie a bunch of fish as her wedding present and hope that, you know, she has many children and invite Roger to perform at a Kaylee later, like they're hiring him. And so he takes care of that. And they also talk about Roger's bona fides, like where he was born from, where's where's Brianna born. And remember, no family can claim Roger. Only Jamie says he's a Mackenzie of Leoch. Like, nobody can do anything about that. Like, but he believes him because Claire told him. <laughs> All right. So they go through this whole thing about hiring Roger. And he still wanted to apologize. He still felt terrible about what he said. It maybe shouldn't have come out that way, but I think it's a valid conversation. And... You know, she presses against him and says, I need Jimmy. I need my baby. Like, she's the kid needs to be breastfed major. Like, he's probably crying. Or Marsley's breastfeeding him. That's the thing. If you had other breastfeeding women, somebody else could feed your baby. And then you'd have to hand express. <laughs> so Roger tries to apologize again. And he's angry because he's realizing how much it would hurt him to think of Jemmy belonging to anyone else, that he could be Bonnets, like really being slammed in the face with that realization is very hard for him. And he says, I need him too, and kisses her. And the final sentence in chapter six is really beautiful as well. The mountain above lay shrouded in mist, invisible. Those shouts and murmurs, scraps of speech and music drifted down like echoes from Olympus. (sighs) So there's a lot of substance in their relationship that we're seeing. But did you, even though there was that misunderstanding, nobody stormed off. It was okay. Like they're maturing in their relationship toward each other. And I really love that. So what do you think about these two chapters? Uh, do you have thoughts? You want to chastise me for something? <laughs> Contact at adramoutlander.com. Please leave me your questions, concerns, thoughts, anything that's on your mind about the books or even upcoming chapters. Just let me know what chapters you're talking about, and I can include those into the podcast. And I just want to say thank you for sticking with me through another read-along. We are still about 42 episodes, I think, if I look. (laughs) Next week, we are doing chapters seven and eight. So it's no problem with you reading ahead because I'm reading ahead. I'm probably on chapter 15 or something right now, slowly reading ahead. I have lots of schoolwork and other things to do, so I'm not getting there quickly. But just come back to these chapters and think about it. We're starting to see how everything is weaving together. I'm, now I'm trying to figure out what time of day it is in this. It has, it has to be afternoon early afternoon, maybe, (laughs) lunchtime. I don't know. It's confusing. (laughs) It's just the longest day ever. It should be three days. (laughs) All right. So how can you support the podcast? Share it with other people. Join the Facebook group. Talk to me on Twitter, Instagram, through the website, dramaoutlander.com. Just join in the conversation. And on Facebook, It is a Drama of Outlander group. Answer a few questions. Come on in. There's about 1,400 of us. It's awesome. And it's a great place to be. And there's very little drama. So it's fantastic. So please go over there and ask to join. You can also support the podcast by going into iTunes for Apple Podcast and leaving me a five-star review. It will help people to find me. You can also do that through whatever streaming service you are listening through if you're not listening directly through the website. And lastly, you can financially support the podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash a of outlander and do an offering every single month that will help me take care of all the debts and bolts and nitty gritty. Um, or you can send a one-time offering. And if you're interested in that, please just leave me an email or voicemail, and I will tell you how to do that. And I appreciate everybody who supports the podcast. It helps. It really, really does help. 
and I think we've covered it. So I'm curious if you think any of this will be in the TV show. I think some of this could be put into another party at River Run, but since we know they're doing the gathering, I just wonder how much of this will be in there. We already have the regulator thing. I think it'll be Jamie getting the militia together and maybe Brianna and Roger's actual wedding. I don't know. It'll be interesting because I think there's a lot of things like Claire's work in the tent is not necessary. McLeod isn't necessary. They can get all this information sitting around the fire eating or being in Joe's tent. I mean, so a lot of this is just we won't need visually for the TV show. But I do really, really hope that there's Frank's letter is there and that there's going to be some additional information that comes up, even though we know that Frank knew already. We don't exactly maybe know all the things that he did. We just know that he knew. So there's still a place for them to talk about the headstone and the letter and what Frank did. I just think it's interesting that Roger didn't bring it with him. Maybe he was terrified to bring something from the future. I don't know, but he memorized that whole long thing. Crazy. All right. So thank you for listening. And I appreciate you. And come back next week, and I want to hear from you, and I love your lovely comments, and I know, again, we're going very long. <laughs> when you see my post notes, which is just a very brief outline, you're not going to figure out how I got to an hour and a half. <laughs> but I thank you, thank you, thank you for listening, and we're getting to the end of winter, and I couldn't be happier, and I'm hoping you'll be back next week, and until next time, slon java.